Thank you, Jim, for those kind words of introduction, and thank you to the Pioneer Institute for hosting yet another one of your stellar events. As I look around this room, I see so many faces familiar from so long ago uh, who contributed so much, who worked so hard to make education reform a reality. Just uh, speaking about our panelists today, uh, we have Sandra Stotsky, whom I consider to be something of a mentor on matters educational. Trip Jones, who has been mentioned, was the chief of staff. To Mark Roosevelt, the co-chair of the education committee. David Driscoll, who was there at the creation and certainly played a central role through the implementation of education reform. And Mike Sentence, who was the chief education advisor to Pia Dodd Robertson, who was our first Secretary of Education, appointed by Bill Weld, of course, the governor who signed the Education Reform Act into law. So as I look around at all these old familiar faces, I think I have a premonition of what it will, f what it will feel like on Resurrection Day. <laughs> 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 but um, I am very happy to be here and, and to celebrate the accomplishments of the last 20 years. I, I very well remember that stifling, hot day when Governor Weld signed the Education Reform Act into law at the unair conditioned Holmes School in Malden. And if you had told me on that day that more than 90% of our students would pass MCAS, that we would have 13 consecutive years of improvement on our SAT scores, if you had told me that our students would rank first in the nation in every category and every grade tested on NAEP, the so-called National Report Card, if you had told me that our students would place at or near the top on international math and science tests like the TIMS, I would have thought you were unrealistically optimistic. We all had our ambitious hopes for education reform on that day 20 years ago at the home school, but I doubt that any of us would have dared to predict the success we have enjoyed under the Education Reform Act. And although we had a lot of hopeful people, there were, was a lot of healthy skepticism about the promise of education reform. And this was born in part by a succession of previous efforts at education reform, which came forward, which were much ballyhooed and were announced with uh, great fanfare only to fizzle out after a year or two. I remember there being two groups of skeptics on opposite ends of the ideological spectrum about education reform. One group thought we were just throwing money at the education problem. And the other group, based on our, the state's experience with education reform, thought that we would never keep the commitments we were making to fund education moving forward. I think that we have confounded both sets of critics. In 1993, we witnessed the grossest disparities in spending in our public schools. So that in some districts we were spending $10,000 per child per year, and in others we were spending $3,000 per child per year. And in those circumstances, to pretend that we were affording our children anything remotely approaching equal educational opportunity was nothing short of fraudulent. And the quality of education was qualitatively different in every school district as a result of those disparities in spending. And the state did precious little to insist on a uniform standard across the board. 
1993, there were but two state-imposed standards to get a high school graduation. One year of American history and four years of gym. Clearly a testament more to the lobbying prowess of gym teachers than to any pedagogical theory. But the Education Reform Act strove to change all that, to change the funding mechanism, to change the expectations for our students. And I, I think that we have largely succeeded. Um, it's often thought that the problematic school districts were urban and minority school districts. And that is partly true, but only partly true. In 1993, in the small central Massachusetts community of Wales on the Connecticut border, we had 65 kids in a single classroom. 65 kids in a classroom. That is not worthy of the name public education. At best, that is child custody. And the Education Reform Act sought to address those unconscionable and ultimately unconstitutional conditions. And in doing so, the Education Reform Act was a fairly complex and complicated piece of legislation with many innovative initiatives. Under education reform, we imposed a subject matter test for prospective teachers. We removed school committees from the hiring process with the exception of the hiring of the superintendent. And we created charter schools, which Jim has mentioned has been so successful. And I would uh, point out in the uh, Senate version of the Education Reform Act, there was no cap on charter schools. <laughs> But the, the act was not complex just because it had a multiplicity of initiatives. At its very core, in Chapter 70, there was complexity. The funding and distribution formulas were exceedingly complex. And on this point, I want to uh, heap some words of praise on, on Governor Weld. Um, Mark Roosevelt and I as the co-chairs of the Education Committee, negotiated what would become the Education Reform Act with Bill Weld and, uh, and Paul Salucci. May, may he rest in peace. Um, I was very impressed by what a quick study Governor Weld was on education reform. He didn't understand just the terms and conditions of the Education Reform Act, but he understood the secondary and tertiary implications of changing one provision or another. Now, I'm not eating humble pie up here. I, I think I had my arms around education reform as well, but I was just the chair of the Education Committee. The Education Reform Act was basically the only thing I was doing, and I could spend a lot of time thinking about and understanding the implications of what we were proposing. The governor had responsibility for every aspect of state government, from economic development to tax policy to education reform. He could not possibly have spent the amount of time I spent trying to grapple with these issues, but he was a quick study, and, and he, he certainly had, had a very firm grasp on all of, all of the issues presented by education reform, and that allowed him to have the confidence to make compromises with us that a less secure person might not have done. And he made these compromises sometimes in the face of the vocal consternation of his own staff members. I, I remember one time the governor acceded to one of our positions, and as I stand before you here today, I can't even remember what the issue was. And his, his staff was audibly upset and protested about this. And the governor he, he turned slightly red in the face, and he, he turned to his staff members and says, don't worry about it. 
I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> That's not a joke line. <laughs> It's true, he did know what he was talking about and he did know what he was doing. And you know, now that the statute of limitations has passed, these negotiations <laughs> took place behind closed doors. When it came to the um, funding formula, the distribution, the very progressive funding formula that gave much more money to poor communities than to wealthy communities, Governor Weld proudly declared himself to be a communist, his word, a communist. Bill Weld, self-described communist. Uh, I think it, I, I was in state government for 12 years and that was the one and only time I ever heard anybody call Bill Weld a communist. <laughs> but whether he's a communist or a libertarian, he had a grasp on this complex piece of legislation, but for all of its complexity, the Education Reform Act can be reduced in essence to two core principles. We're going to make a massive infusion of state dollars into our public schools, and in return, we expect standards and accountability from all education stakeholders. This is the grand bargain that is the cornerstone of the Education Reform Act. Adequate resources and standards and accountability. They're like two wheels of a bicycle. If you removed one, we couldn't move forward, but with two, we could move forward. And both as a matter of policy and a matter of politics, that's what it required. If we had simply thrown money at our educational problems, as some accused us of doing, the act would not have passed, nor should it have. If we had simply exhorted higher academic performance without material resources, the law would not have garnered majority support, nor should it have. I believe it was our fidelity to those two core principles, adequate funding, and standards that explains a lot about our education reform success. In the 1990s, in the early years of the 20th century, there was, it was unmistakable that education reform was the top priority of state government. There was no question about that. And our budgets reflected that. From 1993 to 2002, we increased the education appropriation by an average of 8% per year for over $2 billion. And over the same period of time, we adopted and applied the MCAS, which I think furthered, uh, and I think correlates with our education success. And Everyone, all state leaders, stood strong behind MCAS, notably including Paul Cellucci when he was governor, despite repeated appeals to retreat from those standards. It is because our faithfulness to those two core principles, funding and standards, has explained so much about our educational success that I'm a bit discomforted by the specter that I see today that our state may be, if not abandoning, at least veering away from those two core principles. With regard to funding, our education appropriation today, adjusted for inflation, is the same as it was in 2002. This differs from the generous expansion of the 90s and, and the first couple of years of this century. As a result of that flat funding over a decade, the Massachusetts Budget and Policy Center has concluded that almost all low income school districts simply do not have the resources needed to provide the caliber of education envisioned in the foundation budget. With regard to standards, 
the Patrick administration is in the process of jettisoning our tried and true reliance on MCAS and replacing it with a totally unproven national standard and test called the Common Core. Now there are others who will speak today who know, who are much better positioned and know a lot more than I do to speak about a substantive comparison of MCAS and the Common Core. Sandy Stotsky, for, for one, is far more capable of making those comparisons than I. But what I fear politically is the political implementation of the Common Core standards. I believe 44 states in the District of Columbia have adopted the Common Core. Almost all of the lowest performing educational, the educationally lowest performing states in the nation have signed on to the Common Core. Nationally administered tests suggest or demonstrate that students in states like Alabama and Mississippi could not hope to reach the standards in the foreseeable future that we have established in Massachusetts and that our students have met. They couldn't hope to reach those standards. But it, this was an issue that we actually faced in the Education Reform Act in Massachusetts. We had low performing districts and high performing districts, but at least we had a strategy to address that so that we could reasonably expect all of our students to come up to the same standard. And the strategy was that progressive funding formula that Comrade Weld supported <laughs> so, so strongly, uh, that w with much more money being spent on poor school districts than wealthy school districts so that the poorer kids could realistically be expected to rise up to the same standard. Maybe it wasn't enough, and the stubborn achievement gap perhaps argues that it wasn't enough, but at least it was an intellectually honest strategy to address the problem of disparate performances. Nobody is suggesting that the federal government ought to pour resources into the Alabama schools so that they are as well financed and have as high standards as Massachusetts schools. And if there is no strategy under Common Core to lift the lower performing states up to the higher performing, I'm afraid that all of the political vectors will simply push the bar down so that everybody can clear that bar. There's no point, after all, in having national standards if a goodly number of states can't realistically expect to meet those standards. And I fear that the political answer may be to lower the standards so that all states will be able to clear the bar, and that will be a standard that is much lower than we have set in Massachusetts, and much lower than we have achieved, that our students have achieved in Massachusetts. And that's why by our signing on to the Common Core, Massachusetts signing on to the Common Core, I think that may well suggest a settling for a lower standard than we have previously adhered to, and a lower standard that our students have demonstrated they can meet. This might be one of those rare instances where what is good for the nation is bad for Massachusetts. So after 20 years, I think there's a great deal to be proud of about education reform. But unless we continue to adhere to the core principles that explain much of our success, I'm afraid we could potentially squander that success. I sincerely hope I'm wrong. Thank you very much.